Hello and welcome. In the 21st century, sexuality is more explicit than it's ever been, and most see sexuality as central to who they are. Yet we increasingly seek to eradicate sexuality from our public lives. Most people no longer think flirting is acceptable in the workplace, and the rise of dating apps has made sexual advances in bars and clubs less common. So should we see sexuality as irrelevant to our everyday lives and regard it as a realm best isolated from our work and friendship groups? Or are our sexual desires the key to our identity and attempt to remove it, uh, and attempts to remove it from the rest of our lives as a repression of our true selves? Well, we'll be exploring that question tonight at this debate as part of the How the Light Gets In Winter Revel. Uh, my name is Rana Mitter, I'm your host for this evening, and I'd like to start by introducing our speakers tonight. First of all, we're going to have Nikki Adams, who works with the English Collective of Prostitutes, a network of women working for the decriminalization of sex work and for sex workers' safety. We then have Mickey Kendall, who is the New York Times bestselling author of Hood Feminism, Notes from the Women, a Movement Forgot. And she writes on topics including media representation, police brutality, food insecurity, and other issues that impact marginalized people. Then we have Yasmin Alibi-Brown, an award-winning author and columnist. She writes regularly for the I newspaper and has written for the New York Times, The Observer, and a whole wide range of other publications. Her newest book is Ladies Who Punch, an intriguing title indeed. And Olivia Fain, who is the author of novels and also non-fiction work, most recently Why Sex Doesn't Matter, which addresses the politics, obsessions, and misconceptions of one of the most important aspects of human existence. But before we go any further, I'd like to hear our speakers opening pitches and each of our speakers will have up to three minutes to present thoughts on the following opening question. Is sexual desire key to our identity? Who better to start us with than Yasmin Alibi-Brown? Yasmin, please go ahead. Now, let me just say, I love sex. I'm very lucky to get it with somebody who also loves sex and with whom I live. So I'm not being prudish and I'm not being um, um, uh, fanatically uh, uh, Puritan. But I think this is such a reductive way of looking at identity. Um, and, and actually, uh, in, in my view, uh, deeply disrespectful of, of a wide range of human beings. You know, I watch a lot of animal programs. We all do. Animals are driven by food and sex. We humans have much more to us than that. Much, much more. Um, what is my... Oh, it was a very good question. How do I identify myself? My brain identifies me. My face. My heart. Um, my limbs when they're working. And yes, sexual desire is a part of the composite, but it, it may not be at certain part of my life. I'm a very old person, a much older person than all the rest of the panel. So what are we saying here? That when sexual desire wanes or becomes less possible or, less di or more difficult or you're left alone and are not with a partner, that you cease to be a being? Are we saying that? If you put sexual desire so at the heart of who we are. So I kind of think it's a part of who we are. And like it or not, a time comes when sexual desire cannot be the central part of your life like it was when you were in your 20s. Um, and I think it kind of reminds me of a, a sex object, objectification if you put this at the heart of identity, then you're saying, you know, sex and sexuality and sexual activity and desire is what makes you who you are. Um, and, you know, that's the society in which we are now living, where for young people, the pressure to be defined by sexual desire and, and much activity is having quite a devastating effect, I think. There was a very mm -hmm. interesting piece in the Sunday Times recently about young men, really fit young men who are really looking after their bodies, suffering from erectile dysfunction. And some of them were affected by the society where sex is everywhere and they don't feel they're good enough or stud enough or whatever it is that they feel. 
So I, I think this is, this is something I, I, I really reject. It's part of who I am and part of what many humans are, but it's not part of men, the, the lives of many human beings who live incredibly full and exciting lives. Jasmine, thank you very much indeed for a very clear opening statement and I think putting our agenda right on the, the table there. May I turn now to Nikki Adams. Nikki, could I take, could we have your view on this question? Go ahead. Um, well, I, I think that uh, sexual desire, sexuality and even our identity are very uh, quite fluid concepts and they're often de determined by forces outside of our control. And, um, you know, we live in a society dominated by the market and none of us are exempt from that. And so um, the, those, those uh, concepts are uh, often dominated in the same, by uh, the forces that are ranged against us. And I wanted to um, start with a quote really, which I think is really great and really applicable. It says, um, culture is plays and poetry, but culture is also the shrill of the alarm clock that rings at 6 a.m. when a black woman in London wakes her children to get them ready for the baby minder. Culture is how cold she feels at the bus stop and then how hot in the crowded bus. Culture is the spread of the line, sorry, the speed of the line or the weight and smell of dirty hospital sheets. Culture is making the tea while your man watches the news on the telly and culture is an irrational woman walking out of the kitchen into the sitting room and without a word turning off the telly for no reason at all. And that's the truth of sexuality too. It depends on your perspective and your experience and how much power you have in the society. I'm from the English Collective of Prostitutes, the Sex Workers Collective. We see sexuality through the same prism that we see our daily lives. That's from the point of view of the single mum skipping meals to feed her kids. It's from the point of view of the woman on a zero hour contract who has to endure her boss touching her up because otherwise she won't get the shift she needs to live on. <clears throat> the woman docked 30 pounds from her universal credit because she tripped over one of the obstacles deliberately put in her way. And of the women who've got no recourse to public funds, whose friend offered to put her up in exchange for the occasional fuck. And of the sex worker, the woman who decides to commercialize her sexuality in order to get financial independence and more control over how she lives, who she sleeps with, how often and under what conditions. So sexual desire is integral to our lives, but when our lives are dominated and dictated by poverty and overwork, then so is our sexuality. The increase in prostitution is sometimes misinterpreted as an increase in sexualized encounters, but prostitution is increasing because women's poverty is increasing. Prostitution is not driven by men's desire for sex, but by women's need for money. And so often it is an act of resistance and refusal the refusal of dependence and the control and the refusal of poverty and the degra degradation that comes with it. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Nikki, for again, an extremely powerful opening statement of one that sets the agenda extremely clearly. Could I turn now for our third um, pitch on this question to Olivia Fain. Olivia, over to you. Well, uh, if sexual desire really is key to our identity. Oh my goodness, what a, what a sad, sorry lot we are. Uh, Yasmin, I'm completely uh, with you here. Feminists complain about uh, the objectification of women and the male gaze, but it's a biological fact. The optic nerve is connected to the hypothalamus, which sends a message down to the pituitary gland, which sends a message down to the gonads. And to complain about the male gaze would be like complaining that the lungs were connected to the windpipe. Men desire women and other men who are pleasing to the eye. And men are the only villains here. Women desire good looking men. I mean, that's what human beings are like. We desire and we all do it. We gaze and twas ever thus. And uh, if you remember Helen of Troy, whose face launched a thousand ships and it wasn't her, her stellar career, her wit, her 
formed yeah. a kind heart which launched those thousand ships. No, it was her beautiful face. And that's the problem. If you have sex. To continue watching this video, click the link in the top left or in the description below. Or visit iai.tv for more debates and talks from the world's leading thinkers on today's biggest ideas.